This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. What is it about fire? What is it about the dancing of the flames that you just can't help but get lost in them? Why do we gather around and stare at them in groups? Sure, we gather around them for warmth, but go to any campfire, everybody's staring at it. We can stare into a fire for hours, it can hold our attention as well as any TV show. Maybe we're just drawn to non-repeating patterns. Maybe there's something about the color that's especially pleasing to our eyes. Maybe we're just moths. There are some who believe that fire is what made us who we are. That once we learned to control fire, it not only changed how we ate, making it possible to get more nutrition out of food, but also that watching fire stimulated our brains. Gathering around the fire provided opportunities to bond and communicate with others, share ideas. And all this extra stimulation grew our prefrontal cortex and made us human beings. Our connection to fire goes way deep. In fact, the chemical reactions that power our cells and bodies are very similar to the ones that are involved in combustion. We are, in a very real sense, living fire. But fires go out. There's a toxic substance that's around you at all times. It's in the air you breathe and the water you drink. It's in every single cell of your body. And it's slowly eating you alive. I'm not talking about that feeling of imminent doom, <laughs> although it's there. No, I'm talking about oxygen, which is something you probably never think twice about until you can't breathe. So we all know you can't live without oxygen. It's essential to life on this planet, or at least to life as we understand it. But why? Like, what exactly does it do once we breathe it in? And why did we evolve this way? And where did it come from in the first place? Yeah, I don't know about you. I never really thought about it. And then I did, and I looked it up, and it turns out it's, it's pretty interesting. Interesting in a, a, oh cool, a new existential crisis kind of way. So let's start with what you already know. The majority of the oxygen on our planet comes from photosynthesis. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide, they breathe out oxygen. And then we breathe in oxygen and release carbon dioxide, and then they take that, turn it back into oxygen. It's the great oxygen cycle that powers our world. The oxygen cycle that's deeply interconnected with the carbon cycle because uh, CO2 is just an oxygen molecule with a carbon atom attached to it. Also sunlight hitting water vapors can create oxygen by splitting off oxygen from an H2O molecule. But the single biggest producer of Earth's oxygen comes from one of its tiniest organisms, a little bacteria called Prochlorococcus. This is found in the oceans and it produces up to 20% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. In fact, scientists estimate that nearly 80% of the oxygen in our atmosphere was created in the oceans. But the world hasn't always been like this. Before 2.4 billion years ago, there was very little oxygen in the atmosphere. It was mostly nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. And the oceans may have been green and not blue because of all the iron in it. And there was single-celled life at this time, but it was anaerobic life, meaning it doesn't need oxygen. But then, yeah, about 2.4 billion years ago, some photosynthesizers started to show up, specifically cyanobacteria. And it was able to take the sun's rays and use that to convert carbon dioxide and water into energy. And the waste product of this reaction was oxygen. This way of making energy was super efficient and cyanobacteria just immediately won out over everything else. It took over the world and its farts filled our atmosphere in what scientists call the great oxygenation event. All that oxygen in the atmosphere killed off all the anaerobic microbes and the world changed dramatically. There was less carbon dioxide in the air, temperatures dropped, and yeah, most of the existing life on the planet died off. Which is sad. Poor little anaerobic bacteria. But it did set the world on the path of genetic diversity that led to us being here today. So it's probably a big mistake. Okay, so now we know where the oxygen is from, but where is it from? Well, oxygen has eight protons. So like any element that's bigger than hydrogen and helium, uh, it was created in supernova explosions that then got scattered out into gas clouds that eventually coalesced into planets like Big Blue here. And oxygen is actually the third most abundant element in the universe after hydrogen and helium. And it's been around for quite a while. A team of astronomers published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal Letters in 2020 describing how they detected large amounts of oxygen in an ancient star. The star, which has the catchy name of J0815 plus 4729, is an elementally depleted star located more than 5,000 light years away toward the Lynx constellation. The astronomers suggest that the star's primitive composition shows that it was formed, quote, during the first hundreds of millions of years after the Big Bang, possibly from the material expelled from the first supernova of the Milky Way. So yeah, the oxygen you're breathing right now, it's old, it's ancient, it is wise. If you listen to your breath, you can hear the wisdom 
of the universe. Okay, so we've got its origin story. Now, what makes it so special? Like, how does it support combustion? Why does fire need it to burn? What makes it so reactive? How does it cause rust? So concerning combustion, there's three things required to make a fire. They call it the fire pyramid. It requires fuel, something that burns. It requires some kind of energy put into the system. And it requires an oxidizer, which is a molecule that accepts electrons. Okay, so this is the best way that I can possibly explain it, but just keep in mind that this guy really struggled in chemistry class. Okay, so those of you who follow space stuff are aware that uh, thermal management is a big part of space flight because there's uh, no atmosphere in space, so there's nothing for heat to sort of conduct into. You know, this is why the ISS has heat exchangers and radiators to keep it from getting too hot. Well, combustion, the act of combustion, is basically fuel donating electrons. And just like the heat on the space station, those electrons need some place to go. And not all molecules have room for new electrons. But oxygen does, and here's why. Oxygen in a neutral state has eight protons and eight electrons, with the protons smushed together in the nucleus and the electrons configured in shells of two and six. But it wants to have eight electrons in its outer shell. This makes it electronegative, so it wants to steal from atoms that give up their electrons so it can complete its outer shell. And look, I know I'm being really super simplistic with the language, but this guy was too busy drawing in chemistry class to pay attention. And I never even got good at it. So fire is the visible effect of combustion. A fuel with electrons to spare meets a source of energy, oxygen takes the electrons, the fuel is transformed, and what's left over is smoke and ash. Another visible effect of combustion is rust. So rust is also known as iron oxide because it is iron that has been oxidized. Rust is an example of corrosion, which is an electrochemical process that involves an anode, a piece of metal that gives up electrons, an electrolyte, and a cathode, a piece of metal that accepts electrons. As the metal corrodes, the electrolyte offers oxygen to the anode. When oxygen combines with metal, the electrons are freed. And as they move through the electrolyte to the cathode, the anode's metal transforms, and what's left over is rust. By the way, some of that sounds like how a battery works. Yeah, that's kind of the same principle as the battery works on. And in a similar but different way, this is also what's going on inside your body. When you eat, oxygen oxidizes the food to create energy by combining with sugars. So what happens is when we digest food in the gastrointestinal tract, those sugar molecules pass into the blood. The blood moves the molecules to the cells and mitochondria break out the molecules chemical bonds to release energy. And cells need oxygen to complete this process. So at the same time that your guts are breaking down those sugars and passing them through the bloodstream, your lungs are breathing in oxygen. This oxygen travels through the tubes in your lungs called the bronchi. These branch off into smaller tubes called bronchioles. Tiny air sacs called alveoli are at the end of each bronchiole and tiny blood vessels called capillaries cover the alveoli. This is where the oxygen gets passed into the blood. This oxygenated blood travels to the heart, which pumps it out to the cells in the body, and then once in the cells, it combines with those sugars in the mitochondria. And this is called cellular respiration. Those sugars in the food get broken down into glucose, and then glucose gets into the mitochondria and gets transformed into ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. So yeah, similar to how fire uses oxygen to steal electrons from the fuel to burn, um, in your body, your mitochondria uses oxygen to steal electrons from the glucose to turn it into ATP, and what's left over is carbon dioxide and water. The blood then delivers that carbon dioxide into the capillaries, which makes its way to your lungs, into the alveoli, where you exhale it and remove it from your body. So our bodies rely on one of the most corrosive elements in the periodic table to live. Unsurprisingly, this does eventually take a toll on our body. So we breathe an average of 22,000 times a day, and most of the time the oxygen gets into our blood, everything's cool, everything's great. But about 2% of the time, things go a little wonky. This is when our metabolism produces free radicals. You've probably heard that term before. A free radical is basically an oxygen atom with an unpaired electron attached to it. Free radicals are super unstable, so they just try to find something to attach themselves to. Uh, and that could be anything from lipids, proteins, to nucleic acids. And this is what antioxidants are for. They're compounds that help to prevent the creation of free radicals in the first place. And uh, our body produces this naturally, but when it gets out of whack, then the cells go into what's called oxidative stress. And this is one of the major contributors to aging-related diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, diabetes, inflammatory disorders, male infertility, and Parkinson's disease. So yeah, according to the free radicals theory, superoxides and free radicals can uh, attack and damage a cell's components. Constant maintenance is required, but over time it can get to be too much and a cell can start to lose its function. And while studies over the years on antioxidants have been proven somewhat inconclusive, there is one waste product from mitochondria that can actually help. 
Yeah, according to a study published in the journal Aging, high levels of a peptide called humanin, which is produced in the mitochondria, has also been tied to longer lifespans and better health. In fact, the researchers discovered that humanin levels were lower in Alzheimer's patients as compared to a control group. So yeah, that's where oxygen comes from, that's how it came to dominate this planet, and that's how it keeps you alive while simultaneously rusting you from the inside out. It giveth and it taketh away. It taketh... sure. On this planet, anyway. On another planet, who knows, another oxidizer might be favored. Uh, fluorine, for example, is super electronegative. Um, it's very reactive. It explodes when exposed to air. But maybe in a different environment where there's different pressures and different temperatures and whatnot, maybe it would combust in a more measured way like oxygen does here, and maybe a form of life could be created around that. Now, regardless, when we point our telescopes into the universe looking for habitable planets, we look for oxygen, because the kind of life that we know of farts out oxygen. But that might not be the only way that a planet could wind up with oxygen in its atmosphere. You know, I mentioned earlier that oxygen is made from photosynthesis. It can also be made by solar radiation splitting off oxygen from water molecules. So it is possible that a water-based planet, if it was too close to its star, could be bombarded with enough UV radiation to split a bunch of water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen would escape to space, making most of the planet's atmosphere oxygen. Even though the water has boiled off from below, it would still have a thick oxygen atmosphere, no life required. So yeah, in a lot of ways, those same forces that create the, the campfire that may have transformed humanity as we know it is going on inside of us, our entire lives. Maybe that's why we do have such a connection to fire, because we are a kind of fire. We are basically just a complicated way to get this to give up its electrons to bacteria farts. Until the bacteria farts kill us. Bon appetit. But you know what? Maybe there's more to fire than all that. And if this all sounded interesting to you, I've got the perfect show for you to watch. It's called Nigel Lotta Blow Stuff Up, and it's on Curiosity Stream. This show is exactly what it sounds like. Nigel Lotta is a psychologist and TV show host from New Zealand who explores various topics by, you guessed it, blowing stuff up. There's a particular episode on fire, which goes in depth on some of the stuff I've talked about in this video, along with episodes on gravity, electricity, sound, and space, for all you space nerds out there. He's a great presenter, and the series is a lot of fun. It's definitely worth a watch. This, of course, is just one of thousands of documentary series on Curiosity Stream from some of the best documentary filmmakers from around the world. If you like entertaining and educational content, this is the streaming service for you. Even better, with your subscription to Curiosity Stream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite YouTube channels where you can watch our videos ad-free. That means both pre-rolls and these sponsor messages, like what you're hearing right now. And coming soon on Nebula is the final episode of my Mysteries of the Human Body series, which will deal with the mystery of aging. Uh, some of what I talked about in this video is in there, along with some other theories on why we age and how we can reverse it. And you, dear viewer, can get both of these streaming services for 26% off of the uh, regular annual rate for only $14.79 a year for two streaming services. It's insane. So if you're curious, just go over to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott to get started. It's, it's seriously the best streaming uh, bundle you're going to find anywhere on the planet. I've watched both of them quite a bit. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you haven't checked it out, just, just go check it out. CuriosityStream.com slash Joe Scott. Links downstairs. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the community members here on YouTube who are uh, just being awesome people and supporting and I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, there's some new people that have joined, some new members. Let me shout them out real quick. We've got Rachel Ann, Carmelo Quijano, uh, Andrew Carey, Greg Capella, Mark Hoffman, Wreckage Rider, Daniel Butcher, King Miller 1982, Martin Vescaru, Lynn Battersby, and 12XU. Nailed it. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and get a little button by your name, make you stand out in the comments, uh, you can just hit the little join button right below this video. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like that video. So you can take a look at that one, or look at any of these down here that got my face on them. And if you enjoy them and you want to come back for more, I do invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.